Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and today we have a special guest. We have Crystal Shivers, and she um, uh, she has a group or a page called uh, Kid of Paws, Kid of Parental Alienation Syndrome. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Danica. So in this series, we're the, the last few weeks, I have been really focusing on ch uh, adults who experience parental alienation as a child. And that's one of the reasons I have you on here, uh, because you've been able to provide our, our viewers lots of helpful information. Um, so I guess we'll just jump right into this. So you had, you were alienated uh, and from your father, didn't have a relationship with him. And then um, what I want you to do is talk to me a little bit about it for the, for the audience, but also we want to get to what would have made a difference for all of those people who were trying to keep you in the fold, uh, build, you know, keep you connected with the alienated side of the family. Um, maybe you can give our viewers some advice on what would make a difference for them. All yeah, right. absolutely. So you want me to dive into about like my timeline of when it happened and how long it lasted? Is, is that it? Yeah, we'll touch on that because I know we don't want to get, we, we really want to get into the, you know, what could make a difference for the listener. Yeah. But at least, at least they can have a little bit of context as far as who you are and how it is that you became, you were an adult child of, an, of alienation. Yep, no, definitely. I can give it to you in a nutshell. So I was about um, five or six. There's a timeline at the top of my page uh, that has it on there. So I was about five or six years old uh, when that was the last time that I saw my dad really ever again until I was an adult. So my alienation, um, if you're if you're watching this, you're going through it. So you're familiar with the fact that um, you might reconnect and then that connection is going to probably get severed again and then you're going to have to also reconnect again so my journey it, it also includes that so um, there was a period of 17 years where I did not see my dad or anyone in his side of the family um, and then we reconnected and you know there's a lot to unpack a lot to deal with and um, he had a lot going on in his life. I had a lot going on in my life. And we both just kind of like went, okay, this, <laughs> this just isn't for us right now. And we took a step back. And then there was a, um, a break again for probably five, five years or so. Um, and then we, you know, had to see each other because we were at the same family funeral. Um, and you know, everyone at the family was kind of like, Oh, come on, you know, you two should talk, you two should talk. And, um, again, I was guarded and resistant. Um, but I, I felt a difference in him this, the second time around and things were different in his life. And he and I, uh, we reconnected and we've been, uh, we've been connected and, you know, working on our relationship. I like to think of it as, uh, if you go buy a, an old home or if you get an old car, you know, like. Yeah, the, the bones are good, right? But there's a lot of, of time and care and attention that's going to have to be put into that car or that house to restore it, right? So, um, you know, this isn't for the faint at heart because you're, you're both coming to it with, with, with hurt feelings. But um, I think it's just knowing that, hey, we're both dealing with this, um, this pain, but we both love each other and we want to see, see what we can, we can develop and cultivate from this. Yeah, you know, that's the thing is a lot of time when you're when you're raised by a parent, there's there's all of these bonds that are made incrementally throughout childhood. And now you're you're looking at two adults who know that they're related, but it's not the same. It's not necessarily father daughter kind of relationship. Would you would you agree? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, you're you're not father daughter like yes this is my dad but it's also a stranger right so um one of the ways that that i like to try to make it relate to people is it's like you know have you ever been out in public and like ran into someone who you consider to be a celebrity and you just like stare at them and like just want to take them in because it's like oh wow they're they're a real person right it was the same type of sensation i would say um when i would just sit down and spend time with my dad. I would just like literally just sit and stare at the man. Cause I'm like, this is just so wild. Like 
I have memories of you as a child and then like nothing. And now here we are sitting and talking and we have like the same mannerisms. It's just, it's weird. You know what I mean? So it is, it's, it's trippy. I can imagine. I mean, and, and then of course you have a lot of, I can imagine that you, you, there's like these expectations of yeah. this is how it's supposed to go. And, um, yep. Kind of like, kind of like online dating. You're like, well, you have this expectation of it going a certain way, and you're like, oh, well, the chemistry's not there, and, yep. and all that. You no, know, and that that's another piece of it too. It's like um, while we were reconnecting, um, I had expectations of like, okay, this is what my dad should do. This is what my dad should be like, and it wasn't that way, you know, and. I, I had like this emotional journey where I'm like, okay, I mean, I was fine for 20 something years without him. Do I need to continue like putting myself out there? Do I need to continue trying? Cause I was fine. So why don't I just not, not try this anymore? And you know, we just, we have different ways of processing things, different ways of dealing with things emotionally. And so, um, where I maybe usually, uh, would just hold everything in. I'm like, no, oh, we're going to do this. I'm going to unpack. And he's all like, no, I'm keeping it all packed in. So I'm like, well, who are you? And but you know what I mean? So I remember having a conversation with a friend where I just, I shared my heart with her of like, Hey, here's what's going on. And here's how I'm feeling. And I don't know what to do. Like, should I step away? Should I keep trying? And, and her feedback was so good because she just said, you know, um, when you talk about you could, you could deal with not having a dad, like you've been just fine. But when you talk about him, something in you lights up. So you need something from that relationship. You just have to readjust your expectations of what you want from that relationship. And I was that, like, that's deep. That makes so much sense. I mean, we yeah. really do have expectations. Like when, you know, when I was a ch child, Leave it to Beaver was, you know, that family was the, the idolized family, how every, everybody should be. And, um, and you even look at your family, you're like, wait a minute, my mom's not that loving. Um, you know, I'll, it, there's just so many of these expectations. And I can only imagine that you had expectations that he was supposed to be a certain way. And if he didn't meet your expectations, like there again, there's, oh, there's something wrong there. There's something wrong right. with the relationship. Yep. Um, so what I noticed now you are, you chose to reconnect with him, but you have siblings that chose not to. Correct. Um, is that right? And that would be really, it's in a way you're kind of, you're going up against, you're like the minority going up against the majority that's saying, you know, leave it alone. He's out. Right. Um, and that has to be hard. Too. Yeah, no, and, and I think too, I mean, um, it, you know, parental alienation, it's an ideology that whether, you know, you're a child, so whether you want to get bought into it or not, you do, right? Um, most of the time, there are a few kids that as children, they're like, nope, I'm not going to embrace this and I'm not going to go for it. But the vast majority of children, whether they're, they're doing it out of survival or they just believe it, like they, they get bought into it, right? So for, for me and my siblings, it was one of those things where when I finally was like, no, I'm going to reach out and find out what's going on here. It was like, well, what is wrong with you? And so it, it, it created a situation where now I was the enemy and now I was someone who should be targeted and also alienated and cut out from the, the sibling relationships. Wow. Um, and it's something that brings up for me is a lineage. Is there is there any evidence like first of all how is it that your dad and your mom came together like there was obviously I have it that there's there's some magnetism there that has that has one connect to the other and a lot of times it doesn't start with that generation it's something right. that could that there's a history when you start looking at it even it may have not been extremely toxic kind of history, but there might be, have been a marginalized or absentee uh, grandparent or whatever. And, um, and of course it can also flow the other way. Um, right. So, and so what, what's your experience of that? Um, so my mother's parents 
were were married up until my my grandfather passed away. So they were always um, married, but it was a dysfunctional relationship. And then my grandfather was raised by a single mom, um, and I don't know exactly why she was single. I know she was married multiple times, but um, I never knew her. And I mean, I do remember my great grandmother, and um, I never knew her to have a significant other partner. Um, and then on my dad's side of the family, his mother and father, they, uh, he was, I think maybe like in middle school when they divorced. Um, and then my dad and my grandma, they're very close, like probably too close. I'm like, how many times did you call your mom today? Um, I, I give him a hard time about it, but she actually, my understanding was absent from their life after the divorce for the vast majority of their, you know, formative years. Um, so I think for my dad, when it came up that my mom, you know, divorced and then remarried and then literally like took us away, I, I feel like, I mean, it's been expressed to me, but it was also something that I kind of internalized and sorted out was I think that he missed having that closeness with his mom growing up, obviously, because he's so close to her now. Um, and so he just felt like that children belonged with their mom. And it sucked that I don't get to, to be there, but at least you're with your mom. I think that's how he's rationalized it. Wow. Um, it's just amazing. And, and that's just sort of a recent discovery for me in how it is that you, it repeats its cycles. Right. And it's not necessary. It's so easy to make, you know, to see who the alienator is and who mm -hmm. they're targeting. However, there's, I would say that in, in many of the cases, there's an unhealthiness on both ends. Um, like it's, like you said, I mean, your, your dad was the target, but a lot of what happened, what his experience was in growing up, um, impacted him being marginalized. Right. No, definitely. I totally think that. Yeah. So did, um, what was I going to say? So as far as your siblings, your siblings haven't really, you know, for them, they're okay. They're, they, do you see any kind of patterns in their family that, that, um, could be impacted because they didn't have their dad in their life? So it's an interesting situation because, like I said, my mom um, left my dad and then remarried. So I have um, three half siblings. So I have one. So there's five of us. So one, you know, one of us that is uh, my full sibling. I guess you could say. I don't think of them that way, but that's you know the way that it is. So um, my two youngest siblings, they actually grew up with their dad, right? So they have a totally different point of view than the other three of us who, um, did not, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Cause I literally am, am cut off from them. Like we don't have any contact whatsoever. Wow. Um, yeah. The, and, and that's a shame because that's a, that is a, um, you know, that's the missing. It's a huge missing in the relationships that, that you have and, and they have. Um, so one of the things I wanted to go into is to find out what strategies, because you had an aunt in your life that took a stand for your relationship with your dad and you, yep. um, that, that obviously really was a significant thing because I see it on your Facebook. The important yeah. there's this shirt that you've created. Um, well, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sue. Yep. What What is her name? Be like Aunt Sue. Be yeah. like Aunt Sue. Yep. Um, and I think <clears throat> I think a lot of targeted parents have that that sibling or that that mother or that father or somebody in their life uh, that's close to them that has been a stand for the reunification of their relationship. And, uh, and that's wonderful is, can you share a little bit about it with our viewers, um, strategies that made a difference in your life? Maybe strategy, strategies that Aunt Sue uh, had that kept you connected. Yeah, so a lot of people, they, they do, they reach out because, you know, I, um, 
a couple of days before she passed away, I, I went into my email and I have a folder with her name on it. And um, I always put everything she sent me in that folder, whether it was an email string that was a forward, you know, for this to have good luck, or um, she would send me random news articles. And I'd always be like, what is wrong with this lady? But whatever. Um, I mean, just whatever it was that she sent me, I always filed it away. And um, it ended up being about 500 emails that I had from her. And the very first one, because I scrolled and scrolled and scrolled to find the first one, um, was a from some university, I don't remember which one, but it was um, a scholarly article about parental alienation. And um, what I'm about to like share, it's kind of like it's unconventional and it's not what people tell you to do. And I don't even always advocate to do what, she's, what she did, even though I have a shirt on that says be like Aunt Sue. Um, just because Aunt Sue did not she didn't care. She's like, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to speak my truth and share my truth no matter what. Right. And so it's like, you, you have to kind of harness that. But at the end of the day, um, it kept me engaged, whether I was ticked off at her or curious, you know what I mean? It definitely kept me engaged. So, you know, the, like I said, the first email was one about parental alienation, but then she would send me these emails that were crazy long, either ranting about, um, all the, like, how do you not see how terrible your mom is? And she would just outline it. Like, here's why I think your mom is a bad person and all this stuff, which obviously, again, that's not the approach that I would recommend, but she was doing what she could to take a big old spotlight and say, hey, something's not right in your life. Um, and then she would also send me these super long emails where she would just give me an update on everyone in my family. And I don't, I've never met these people. I don't know who they, I have all these cousins that are, they're younger than me. So I don't know any of them. Right. But she wanted to make sure that I knew that I had this family because what she constantly put into her emails, whether they were an email where she was just super upset about my mom or if it was an email where she was giving me a family update, she would always tell me you have a big family and we love you. And this is what you're missing. And so she wanted me to know that. Wow. I mean, she took a big stand. And I tell you, definitely some of those things wouldn't necessarily be recommended. Right. Um, <laughs> but for some, <laughs> some reason, it, it connected with you. Um, did she do that with the other siblings? Um, she reached out to all of us. She didn't, she didn't really care. I mean, as soon as she found an email address for any of us, like she would reach out. She, we always had, um, some sort of a, a business. So there was business email addresses that were available. Um, uh, I was homeschooled and then my mom would do like these pioneer days where you could sign up to come and learn how to weave a basket or make a candle or a, a quilt, like whatever. Right. And she would, go online and sign up to take a class because she's like, well, let's see how this goes. And my mom would like freak out, make this big, huge ordeal about it. And then like send the check back. And I'm like, this is so nuts. But she always wanted to make sure like you've taken these kids from us. You've tried to hide them, but I have found you and I'm obviously not going to come to your class, but I'm going to freak you out, make you think I am. So she just had a presence and she always made sure her presence was known. And I think, maybe the reason why it like finally got through to me was because at least it was consistent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I got it. Wow. I mean, relentless and, totally. and, and yet could totally be interpreted as, you know, I don't know, like, you know, just harassment or whatever totally. from your mom's yeah. perspective. And sure. no, even from my perspective, because I mean, this was back before we really had harassment laws. And I remember going to the library or a bookstore and talking to someone and said, Hey, do you guys have any information about online harassment? And the lady assumed that I was harassing someone and like trying to figure out how to like get out of it. And I was like, no, 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 I'm being harassed. And I want to know what I can do about it. And I mean, back then they were like, well, it's across state lines. There's nothing that you could do. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, I had, so, um, so it worked with you, obviously, um, but your other siblings, not so much. Do they, do they have a relationship with Aunt Sue? So um, my, my oldest brother and I, when we go through this, and I I'm recently talked about it on my Facebook page, but we do go through this cycle where um, he'll just like get upset with me 
because my mom has like said something to him to manipulate him or, or whatever. And he'll just decide that he can't talk to me now and he'll go two to three years. <clears throat> he'll go two to three years. Um, and he won't talk to me. And then all of a sudden he'll decide that he misses me enough that he'll reach back out. So, uh, during the second cycle of that happening, um, when he reached back out, he was like, well, what's going on in your life and how are things? And I was like, listen, um, you know, I know that Aunt Sue was nuts growing up. Like she wouldn't leave us alone and this, that, and another, but I get it now. I mean, she was infuriated because we were stolen and taken away and they had no way of finding us and we were completely erased from their lives. Um, and she's not a bad person. And so I, I kind of think maybe you should give it a chance and talk to her too. And he was like, ah, that's nuts. I don't think so. And then I just kept talking to him about it and he'd go, well, mom told us this, this, and this about them. And I'm like, dude, I've been down there. I've been to their homes. I've spent the night in their houses. Like they're not molesting children. You know, you pretty much can tell you get a, you get those, those red flags. There's none of those. They're not a cult. They're not any of these things that we were told. They're, they are this big dysfunctional family. That's what they are. You know, who isn't a big dysfunctional family? You know, um, they're just normal people. And I think you should give it a chance. And so one afternoon, finally, after talking to him and talking to him and talking to him, he was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. So he calls her and he was just like, okay, that wasn't so bad. And then um, he did, this is my long story to say, he did end up reconnecting, but it wasn't one of those things where just like, oh, since you did it, now I'll do it. Like it took a lot of work to get him to that point. So how is your, your relationship with your mom? How is it currently? Yes. Oh, I do not have one. Um, she, it's just, it's one of those things where, you know, for years I had hoped that maybe she would go to, you know, some therapy or, or, or a doctor or something, you know, and like get better but she's not going to get better. And any time that I engage with her, it's just like, I have journals where I will write down, like after I saw her, like each attack. And it's like, it's so, it was so common that she would just make these passive aggressive comments that it was, I was like, you know what, this is just not healthy. Um, I don't need that negativity in my life. Um, and so, like I said, there are five of us and my understanding through, uh, my dad and then through friends, um, not a single one of my siblings will have anything to do with her. So, you know, at first it was easy to target me and go, oh, well, Crystal's just, you know, she's gay and she's this and she's that and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, she's the problem. But then it was like, okay, yes, now another sibling won't talk to her. Sweet, we're up to three. Oh, yes. Can we get to four? Okay. All five of us. That's, Wow. Like who I'm a denominator here and none of them talk to me. So, you know, I'm not the one turning them against her. You can't say that. Um, you know, I mean that I get, I mean, yeah. So what would, what, what do you think would make a difference as far as really bring, bringing healing, like, ho like whole healing to your family? I don't, I don't think that, that there is going to be whole healing. And then, that's just something that I've had to um, mourn, definitely, and grieve. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't think there's too much damage to too many people. And so everybody is, you know, compartmentalizing and walking around with their own hurt. And I don't think, I don't think my siblings have really dealt with a lot of their own trauma. And so um, I don't, and I know that my, my mom isn't capable of, of healing. So I just, I don't think that there will be um, healing from that point of view. I think we, we can do the best that we can at an individual level though. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily, I think the answer, not all, not every single time, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have this wonderful relationship with your mom and your dad and everybody has this perfect picture. And um, it's really, like you said, I mean, I think it's a self-healing thing. It's yeah. being okay, being okay to be okay. Yeah, and, and getting to that point where you, you're, you're truly okay with that, right? Like some people are like, oh, this is fine, whatever. It's like, no, you're not okay yet. You have to really, you have to process it. Um, and then you have to, like you, you said at the beginning of our conversation, like there's, there's so much 
behind um, intergenerational trauma and realizing that and then saying, okay, what can I do in my life to stop that in our lineage, right? That is the truth. I really do believe that it is, it is a generational thing that can go up on both sides of the, of the family, no matter if, you know, which, which one was the target and which one was the, um, you know, the, the alienator. I really do think there's something to examine about your, your history. Yeah, definitely. It, it doesn't repeat itself. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. No, I had this weird experience this one time where this, this energy healer, I ran into an energy healer and uh, she was like, Hey, can I, can I try some stuff on you? And I was like, I don't know. Okay. And she started doing this. I don't even know what she was doing, but man, she cracked my family on both sides. And you know, what she said to me really stood out to me because she told me that on both sides of my family, the, the people use their mouths for harm. They use their tongues for harm. And I was like, you know what? She's right. Because I have heard really harsh things said on both sides of my family. And so that's been something that I have tried to, you know, really internalize and be aware of because when I was younger, I really had that ability to be quite, quite spiteful with my tongue. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to allow that to continue. Even something as simple as that, like, I don't want that to be something that I'm known for. Yeah. I think that's, that's something that we really, those of us who really want to think like really create our lives and our future, we use things, these things that we've, these experiences. And if mm -hmm. we can somehow see them as instead of wounds, they're wisdoms. Um, right. We get to choose to replicate or choose to use it as an example of not, of how not to be. So. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us and sharing with our viewers a little insights. I, I know that I, I have several people that I work with who are, the, the, their sibling is being targeted as a parent and they're looking for ways to, to somehow keep a connection with these children and, um, you know. And I think that that's the key is to keeping the connection, right? So like, I don't necessarily advocate to be as full force as what Aunt Sue was, but at the same time, I think that consistency is key. So it's like, you know, if you're going to reach out and you're going to try to have a relationship with that child, you have to have some sort of a rapport, right? Well, if you're bouncing in and out of their life and they don't know when you're coming in or not, that, that consistency is key, right? To have that, that strong relationship. I like that consistency because a, a lot of times if people, uh, if you're just waiting, you're a parent that just keeps sending those, those cards, those letters, those whatever. Um, I remember in my own uh, situation, I was non-residential and I called every day, same time, no answer, no answer, no answer. And then one day I could not make that phone call. And the next time I saw the children, I just, I got a tongue lashing for not calling. And that yeah. was like, like, yes, they knew I was calling. They knew I was calling. They just couldn't say, they couldn't acknowledge it. Right. No, definitely. So it's super important for it to be consistent. I definitely uh, agree with that to do not wait for the, the payoff or the acknowledgement yep. to just, to just do what you know to do. So, well, thank you so much, uh, Crystal. I really, um, I love following your page on, on Facebook and the, and your writings and, and all that. And I know that, uh, you're one of those people that give people hope and try to take this as a, as a positive thing because, um, it's such a topic that can be very disempowering. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. So I'm glad to hear that, um, that you think my posts are helpful because that's, you know, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to help as many people as possible because I know that so many people, they get caught up in this and it, it is, it's just a situation of despair. So any way that I can help, I'm more than happy to. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us for another episode of Custody Matters Live. I look forward to seeing you next uh, Wednesday evening and have a good evening.